Our next guest is not a photographer, but he is a journalist in his own way. Elliot Higgins is a leading citizen journalist whose investigations and findings have become uh, one of the most respected sources of information in the world right now. He started as a... Elliot, <laughs> welcome. Elliot started as a blogger under the nickname Brown Moses and uh, now with a small group of colleagues and publishing their findings on their website, Bellingcat, he sifts through thousands of open source and social media sites to investigate a range of issues from corruptions to conflict. It's a pity they're leaving because this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> he was able to demonstrate what are the types of weaponry used in the Syrian conflict. Uh, contradicting the official line fed to us by the Damascus authorities. And in the case of the downing of the MH17 flight over the Ukraine, he was able to precisely locate the field from which the missile had been fired. And there again, at odds with the official line. And from mainstream media journalists to Amnesty International and the European Parliament, many of us look at Bellingcat's findings to inform our reporting. So thank you for being here, and we're really looking forward to, to your presentation, thank you. telling us about your site. Um, so um, Bellingcat um, was founded in uh, 2014, following my um, earlier work. Um, and over the years, we've uh, developed a process. Um, yes. Close. We've developed a process uh, we call identify, verify, and amplify. Now, what that means is we first identify inf information, we then verify it, and then we amplify it. An amplification can be anything from a single tweet to a 200-page report. Um, so I'm going to take you through some examples of how we verify information at Bellingcat. So I'm going to show you an example now. This is from 2011. This is a video that was published online um, by a rebel group fighting inside Libya. And um, what this is showing is a tank. It's coming down a road. They're claiming they've captured this town. But the question is, how do we know this is actually true? So what we start doing is we look at objects in the video that are large that we can find in uh, reference materials. So we can start doing something called geolocation, which is verifying the location. So what we can see here is we can see there's a mosque. It has a dome and a minaret. And it's next to a road. And this road is obviously quite wide because you can actually see uh, that there's two lanes of traffic and a tank fits very nicely uh, in one of the lanes. So what we then do is we start with the first clue that they're claiming isn't TG. Now, they might be lying, but we need to check this out first. So we can go to satellite imagery that shows TG in Libya, and we can actually zoom in um, to the town and see there's this road that's running through it. Then what we do, we, we start going along that road. We can see there's two lanes of traffic. It's quite wide because of the cars. And eventually, we come to a mosque. And we can see the mosque has a dome. And we can see it has a minaret. Um, so what we're then able to do is look at the finer details. So we have this very clear detail of the dome and the minaret. We can get an idea of the position is on the right-hand side of the satellite image looking to the left. Otherwise, the uh, position of the minaret and the dome would be in a, another location in the video. Uh, and we start looking at the smaller details. So we can see the edge of the road. We can see other details in the uh, distance, like the uh, various um, uh, poles and posts and buildings. So what we've done is we've started with these larger details, and we go down to smaller and smaller details until we can be certain that these are the locations that we're looking at. So we're able to say exactly where this video was filmed, confirming the claim that it was filmed in the town of TG in Libya. Now, this is uh, one way of doing it. Um, what I'm about to show you now is an example of a barrel bomb. Oops. I think I've pressed the wrong button there. Help. Here he goes. I think you're back. Ah. OK, so this is a video from uh, uh, Syria. This is actually a fairly historical video. Oh, dear me. So we're having some IT issues here, I think.
Okay, so um, this is a video, um, it's quite a historical one. This is the first ever video of what's known as a barrel bomb from 2012. Now, um, to most of you, that's not going to look very, like very much. Um, it probably looks like someone's pushed over a bin. And there was a lot of cynicism about the claims surrounding this video. Um, for example, this article in Russia Today calling it barrel bomb baloney. So um, how do we actually know this is true? How do we know this isn't just a bin that's been pushed over? Well, one thing we could do with Syria is look at the footage that was being posted online by activists. And this showed all kinds of different things, uh, one of which was this video. And this is also a fairly historical video um, because it actually shows the moment a barrel bomb is pushed out of the back of a helicopter. And in fact, as we kept searching through this footage, we found this video. Um, this video was posted online and it actually shows the interior of a helicopter as a barrel bomb is being um, lit and pushed out the rear. It's basically a giant pipe bomb with a fuse that they've lit with a cigarette. Um, so how do we actually know where this is filmed? Because as with uh, many claims in Syria, you get people claiming, well, this isn't Syria, this is somewhere else, this is fake. Well, what you're actually able to do with this is basically play a game of spot the difference. On one side, you've got the video, and on the other side, you've got the map of all of Syria. Um, after a little while, you can actually find the town in question, and you can do a side-by-side -side comparison. And what you can see is the layout of the roads and the buildings are exactly the same. So you're able to confirm the exact location where this video was filmed and the town the barrel bomb was being dropped on at the time. So this is another way we do geolocation. We can also look at other topics. So for example, there was a social media campaign uh, a few years ago by ISIS. And they encouraged their supporters to take photographs holding a piece of paper. Um, and on that piece of paper, they had a hashtag. And they were sharing this through their Telegram channels. Journalists who are members of those channels secretly then share them on Twitter. And that's how I saw them. And the one on the left-hand side, you aren't going to be able to ge geolocate that. That's just some leaves. It's a bush. That could be anywhere. The one in the middle is inside a shop, so that's a lot harder to do. But the one on the right-hand side, we can geolocate that one. Now, in this one, we aren't immediately looking for satellite images. We have to figure out a way to narrow down where this could be. It's claiming it's in Munster in Germany, but how can we be sure of exactly where it is? Fortunately, Germans are very, very organized, so they have websites where they have useful details like this that lists all the advertising polls and uh, areas in Germany. So we know there's an advertising poll in the picture. We know it's in Munster. And we look for all the results that give us these polls in Munster, which is quite a lot. Um, but fortunately, Munster has some lovely high-resolution aerial imagery of the, the city. And after a while of searching, it's possible to find the exact location. So this is the location in question. We can say what the camera position is. We can start looking at details. So first of all, the obvious uh, thing is the pole. We can see behind the pole, though, uh, the railings that are behind it. We can see the markings that are also on the road. We can see the traffic light that's on the other side of the road and one further behind it. So again, what we're using is available information that's publicly available to figure out exactly where these photographs are taken. And with this one, this was an interesting case because when I saw these photographs, I was really busy. I was uh, doing my ironing. And um, fortunately, I have a lot of people who follow me on Twitter who really love doing geolocation. So I asked them if they could find out where these photographs were taken. And we had four photographs in total, and three of them were geolocated within 10 minutes, thanks to being able to crowdsource the question. The only one that took longer is because the person lied about where the photograph was taken. But they were still discoverable by asking an audience, and that only took an hour to do. Um, so this brings us to why this is actually useful. Well, um, in a recent uh, arrest warrant published by the International Criminal Court uh, about a, uh, for a guy named Bufali in Libya, he was responsible for six execution videos that were published on Facebook by his military unit. Um, the question uh, was, you know, where were these films? The International Cr Criminal Court had published this arrest warrant. The videos were publicly available, so we took a look at these videos. Now, we started off. Um, first of all, by taking the video and extracting the frames from the video. This is the sixth video in the sequence where they would lined up a row of people to be executed. So we started off, first of all, by extracting all the frames from the video and turning it into one composite image. That meant it was easier for us to work with, quite simply. Um, once we had that image, we could start looking for interesting features that might be possible to see on satellite imagery. So we could see stuff like, in the distance, a um, building uh, site in the far distance. Wasn't much to go on, but there was a, fe a wall and a fork in the road. We looked at the Facebook page of the same group, looking for similar places. And in fact, in the previous weeks, they'd been fighting in this area called the Chinese building area. 
and it looks similar to the, what we could see in the distance. Now, what we then do is use satellite imagery to start searching for potential locations that match. So what you're looking at here is the entirety of the, what's known as the Chinese building area in Benghazi, where they'd been fighting. And we search through that imagery looking for a space that might match. And there are many spaces like that, but we're looking for a specific area. And we eventually came across this location. And um, what we did is we looked at this location for the features that match. So we could see there were the buildings in the distance. There was the wall and the fork in the road. But we need something better than that. So what we did is within Google Earth, we were able to position the camera in Google Earth to the exact same uh, angle as the camera in the video. Now look at the bushes as we merge the two images together. The bushes are in exactly the same position on the satellite imagery and on the video. What we did then is look at the satellite imagery from the day of the execution. And these marks appeared on the ground. And if we go back to the video, oh we can see what these marks are. Those marks are the blood pools from the execution itself. So we can say the precise location where these executions took place. What this then meant, once we had established the exact location, we knew where the camera was. And we can do another trick now where we use the shadows being cast by the people in the video to establish the time, because they're effectively working as a sundial. So we can actually figure out the exact time these executions took place and the exact location. We then look at satellite imagery from before and after the date of the execution to establish the day it took place on, just to confirm the date. So from that, we can confirm the time of day it happened, where it happened, and the range of dates it could possibly have happened. Um, so another example of verification that we do is uh, there was a recent report that um, Turkey had bombed a hospital in Afrim. Um, and Turkey denied this, and they published footage um, from a drone. And they were claiming that this was the building that was supposedly bombed, and they showed that there was no damage done to this building whatsoever. And as you can see there, that does not look like there's any damage to that building. So we've got two claims. We've got a claim that a hospital was bombed and a claim it wasn't bombed. So um, there was other Im imagery provided by uh, Turkey. So there was a pulled out view and another view that's even more pulled out still. So we started looking for social media information and open source information about this hospital. We wanted an image. What does it look like? Fortunately, it has a Facebook page with a photograph of the hospital on it. Um, so we had the front of the building. We also have this video that was published two days before the bombing uh, that actually shows a much wider view of the building. This is the entrance of the hospital. We're able to see the building in the distance. We can see other details as well. Um, the thing is, we look at the image we have there, and the building on the left-hand side that was focused on in the drone image does not look like the, the building that is in the hospital imagery. In fact, this building here is a much closer match. So if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we can see obvious matches. For example, uh, the color of the building, where the windows are, uh, the entrance as well is also visible. And we can see in the background as well uh, these apartment buildings. So according to the Facebook page of the hospital and multiple photographs posted over several years, this is actually the hospital building. But is it damaged? Well, we can also look and see very clearly there's a hole in the roof of that building. Um, we can also look at satellite imagery and see that hole wasn't there in the previous day. So that's fresh damage to that hospital building. But we can also see other details. So what we're seeing here is, let's go back to that one. This is the front of the hospital building uh, before the attack occurred. And what's interesting is this area over here. This uh, kind of ledge on the front of the building. This has been damaged um, in the bombing. So now we want to confirm this is the same location by looking at video footage after the bombing took place. So this was filmed just after the bombing took place. And we can actually see damage in this video. So if you look at the top of the building, you can see that area has been knocked down. There's also damage that's on the floor. So we now have this verification that this building has been damaged in this very small time frame around the time it was claimed it was bombed. Uh, we also have this image. This is a composite as well of several images showing the north side of the building that shows more damage. And you get a sense of the angle uh, that we have um, here. Uh, we also have this footage that shows the west side of the building. Um, and in fact, two ambulances. This is actually part of the footage you saw earlier with the damage to the building. You can see two ambulances parked there. And you can see that same ambulance is on the drone footage. So we can date the drone footage. We can date the uh, video footage filmed before and after. So we can confirm that this building was definitely damaged despite the claims of the Turkish military and their drone footage. Um, so this is another example. Uh, this is something that was presented by the Russian Ministry of Defense. 
Now, you're probably going to hear a lot from Russia in the coming days uh, following the uh, chemical attack in Duma. Um, and this is a claim they made um, showing, claiming that this was showing the US forces protecting ISIS. Now, um, the problem is here, we check these images. And one of these images uh, is this one, claiming to be an ISIS convoy being protected by the US. This is, in fact, a still from a video game. The thing with this one, it was immediately debunked because what had happened is a few weeks earlier, someone else had shared the same video footage claiming it was an American drone attacking an ISIS convoy, and it was debunked then. It was discussed on social media. Lots of people saw that discussion, including lots of journalists who were watching the Syria conflict closely. So when Russia put out the same clip, the same frame from the same video, people immediately were familiar with it and immediately responded by saying that's fake. And this is actually one of the few occasions where Russia has actually had to retract imagery it's put out because it's been shown to be fake. Um, so one thing we've done a lot of is looking at the bombing of um, Syria uh, by Russian forces. And this bombing started in 2015. Uh, initially, they were claiming that they were bombing ISIS. In the very first few days, they said, we're here to bomb ISIS. And there were lots of people saying, no, that's not true. So they said, do not listen to the Pentagon about Russian airstrikes. Listen to the Russian Ministry of Defense. So in a way, that's what we did. Because the Russian Ministry of Defense put these videos onto YouTube. They put lots of these videos onto YouTube showing their airstrikes. Now, if you think back to the barrel bomb example, that's exactly what we did here. And using crowdsourcing, we were able to find the location of where many of these videos were filmed, the precise location. And we could verify whether or not they were actually in ISIS territory. And we discovered out of the first 30 videos posted online claiming to be ISIS targets being hit by the Russian Ministry of Defense, only one of those videos was actually correctly identified in ISIS territory. Well, it's very easy for me to say, well, that's not ISIS territory, but how can we be sure? Well, fortunately, Russia provided a map of ISIS territory. And we took that map and we placed it inside Google Earth. And you can, we overlaid it, traced out the areas that were under control of different forces, gray obviously being ISIS, green being other uh, rebel groups. And that allowed us, when we found a location, to immediately say if it was ISIS or not. So here's one video. This was described by Russia as being an ISIS facility. And this is actually a rare video where the bombing was filmed on the ground. So where is this? Well, again, we're able to geolocate it. So we can zoom in, and immediately you'll notice we're not anywhere near ISIS territory. We're heading into this area, which Russia claims is non-ISIS territory, and this location. And we're able to, again, show there's a direct match between this location and the video footage. And this is, in fact, a bakery run by the charity, the IHH. And we're able to confirm that through multiple sources and other information. But this is just one example. I think in total, we've looked at 120 videos. We could verify the location of about 70% of those. And around 60% of those, the location was falsely reported. And also what happened then is when we started writing about this, Russia became a lot more general about their descriptions. At first, they were talking about ISIS, and then they were talking about terrorists. First, they were talking about it's near this town, and then they were talking about it being in a province of Syria. So by reporting on this, they actually became more kind of general in their language. Um, another example from Syria is this video footage. Um, this is the aftermath of a mosque bombing. Um, and it was alleged that Russian or Syrian aircraft had done this. And Russia very quickly put out a denial, saying today the picture is shown by the means of objective monitoring. And they presented this image, and they claimed it was an aerial image of the town where this bombing had taken place, and the mosque highlighted was the mosque that was supposedly bombed. And they said you can clearly see this mosque is completely undamaged. The problem was we geolocated that video footage, and this is the mosque in question. And this is from a drone footage that was taken before the mosque was bombed. And you can see the minaret and other details here. We're able to confirm this is a location in question. So we can compare this location to the location Russia claiming it, claims it is. So we go from here all the way over here, and we can see that mosque with the blue dome and overlay the Russian image. So what they've done is they've lied about the location of the mosque that was bombed. They're claiming this is the mosque that was bombed when it wasn't. It's similar to what we've just seen with the Turkish drone image. So I thought, well, we've got this aerial image. Maybe this aerial image from Russia shows the mosque that was bombed. So we can zoom out and have a look. And first, we can measure the distance between the two locations. And then we can actually put overlay the Russian image on top of the satellite image. 
and it just happens they put the label on top of a location that was actually bombed. Now, I'm going to show you a video now uh, of another bombing. Uh, this was a uh, video produced by The Guardian, uh, taken from White Helmet's uh, camera footage showing a bombing. فتبين انه الغارة استهدفت مدرسة هي ملاصقة للمشفى الميداني ولله الحمد ان المدرسة كانت خارجة عن العمل بسبب القصف الصارخ بين المدرسة وكانت الدفاع المدني كانت تعطل ما يتوشون الغارة سواء التقايت عم تطلب من الناس انه تروح من الموضع وانا, بالع... وأنا بالموقع اتصور الغارة سم الطيران ضرب فالضرب في الموقع اللي أنا فيه على قاعد مترين أو ثلاث مترات بها الصاروخ مني أو أنا وياه الصاروخ أنا حسيت أن جسمي بدي تنزح من الضغط مقابل الأرض كل الناس عم تسمع صوت عيان والناس ما ينتبه علي إنه فيه هو واحد مصار كان فيه شاصير الصدر وحروب بإيد اليسار وشظايا بإيد اليمين وإجر اليسار بالإضافة إلى عطول في كل الجسم والصدر وشبع كبير بال... بالخد... بالفك السفلي بالإضافة إلى الشخ بالعين الله أكبر أنت مضطر أن تتوجه للموقع سواء أنت تعملك كموصي أو أنت عملك كرجل موقيز أو مسعي so Russia gave another press conference and they presented more aerial imagery and this time they were claiming that this bombing did not occur and Russia today reported on their claims. It was a recently alleged that Russian jets destroyed a hospital in the city of Samin uh, causing the Russian Defense Ministry to, uh, well, call on journalists to double-check the stories they publish. I call on the respected mass media not to jeopardize their reputation by publishing fakes like this. But it's not just the media. The accusations are actually picked up by the U.S. State Department. And to prove the hospital is t totally intact, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry provided up-to-date satellite photographs. The building on this image dated October 31st, does not look like it was recently bombed. How can we tell if it's the hospital in Sarbin? A year ago, a video was posted on YouTube that shows the hospital under construction. Here's a screenshot from that year-old video. And here is the Washington Defense Ministry's aerial image of what it says is the hospital. We see a similar dome-shaped structure next to the building on both images. We see a wall or a fence positioned in a similar way. So where exactly is the hospital that Russia is accused of hitting? So the first thing we do is check if this uh, location is actually correct. Um, so we're actually go able to go to Sarmin and overlay the image. And we can see that the Russian image matches to this location. So we then look at the footage from the white helmets and we do a geolocation of that. So what you're seeing here is Sarmin Hospital on the left hand side. And if we move the imagery further to the north and zoom in a bit, we can start seeing some interesting details. So the camera position is pointing to the north. We have uh, here marked in green the area where the cameraman is stood when the explosion happens. We have here an interesting structure. So this satellite image on the right-hand side is from before the bombing occurred. And we can see this very regular building. It has a very regular edges. And we can see that in the video footage. We can also see next to it four poles. And those four poles are casting shadows in the satellite imagery from before the attack. We can see a wall behind it, which has also got a very regular shape. Now, let's just look at the footage again of the bombing. And we can see, again, the poles that are visible. We can see the walls that are behind it. Now, the bomb will land around the position of the motorcyclist just to the left of the wall. <laughs> I'm 
So, as a result of that, there's a lot of damage done um, to those areas. So, what we can see is that square building is now completely destroyed. The poles next to it, only two of them are last, left standing. And if we move to the left, we can see the wall has been completely destroyed. So, let's take a look at the Russian image. What can we see? Well, for one thing, we can see that square building. It's still standing. We can see the four poles. They are still standing. We can see the wall. It's still standing. They haven't lied about the location. They've lied about the time of the aerial satellite imagery. So this is another example of how this information can be verified and fact-checked even when evidence is being presented. Uh, there's one more example. This time, um, this is from a bombing of a hospital in Aleppo uh, called M10 Hospital. This is a press conference that Russia gave where they presented satellite imagery. Now, this satellite imagery that they present is extremely poor quality for some reason. Um, and they claim this is before and after the bombing have occur has occurred. And they're saying that there are no changes to the facility that can be observed. And based on that, they are saying that it proves that the accusations are untrue, that they are fake. So again, we search for all the information. We can find the videos, the photographs, and other details. And what I discovered during this is this same building was bombed on three different occasions. There are a couple of near misses. And the second near miss was shown in this video, where you can see the east side of a hospital building. Uh, you can see um, the crater on the right-hand side of the building. And it's not that huge, large, um, but it gives us a good look around the side of the building because this is the October 1st bombing. And he's, the cameraman walks around the backside, and what we can see here on the wall, just above that blue sign, there's a little dot. And that little dot is a camera, a CCTV camera. And two days later, the CCTV camera was filming. And it caught the moment of another bombing as it occurred. So the precise moment of the bombing is caught on camera. And we can see from the CCTV footage the mo be what it looked like before and what it looked like after. The bomb landed on the east side of the building where that smaller crater was. And we can actually see photographs of the east side of the building showing there's a tremendous amount of damage. Effectively, the crater uh, before was hit by the bomb in this um, October 3rd bombing. So this is tremendous amount of damage that's done to the building. But we have the Russians saying that their imagery doesn't show any damage. So are they lying about the location? Well, in this case, they're not. Are they lying about the date of the imagery? Well, it appears not. But we, we know that because we can look at the satellite imagery available on sources like Digital Globe and Google Earth and compare what we can see in the better resolution imagery on the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And what we can actually see is there's actually damage done to the building, which is visible in both the Digital Globe imagery and the Russian imagery on the left-hand side. This roof has partly collapsed. Another roof has also collapsed. We can also see just about on the low resolution Russian imagery the marking on the ground from the crater that was created on the October 3rd bombing. So what's happening now is we're not being lied about the date or the time. We're being lied about what our eyes can see. Um, so in conclusion, that's the um, kind of work that we're doing at Bellingcat, Bellingcat to verify imagery, bring in information together. Um, I think this is going to be very re relevant in the coming da days with the recent chemical attack in Douma. Uh, Russia already has, uh, is claiming they have evidence that uh, foreign uh, Russophobic security services were involved with faking the chemical attack. So this is the kind of analysis that we'll be doing to verify the claims made by various parties in the attack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're really open to questions. Please um, don't hesitate to speak up. Um, I have a question. How is your information used uh, in, in not only in the media, but by international organizations and governments? Um, so over the last couple of years, we've had an increasing amount of interest from organizations like the International Criminal Court and the uh, New Mechanism on Syria. Um, 
wondering how open source information can be used in their investigations. Um, so really over the last five or six years, we've gone from journalists being interested to uh, NGOs like the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And now uh, we're moving into an area where um, organizations focused on justice and accountability are really interested in how this information can be used and how it can be applied to the work that they're doing. Is it information that is, that is taken into account by governments in their official, um, uh, official decisions? Um, I think it has been increasingly so. Um, it's, it's interesting to see, compare um, in Syria, the reaction to the 2013 uh, sound attack in August 21st in Damascus, and how a lot of the open source information really wasn't part of the uh, kind of discussion in the media among in government and now with the recent chemical attacks where that's become much more important to the narrative so I think there's been a real shift over the last uh, four years in how many different kinds of organizations how governments and NGOs are using this information and how reliable they believe it to be please come up with um, any questions that you may have as we're discussing yes Shahidul. <laughs> well Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating and very rigorous, very well researched. Congratulations. My question is, you pointed out to several situations where the Russians have obviously, according to you, uh, faked it. Have you looked at US, um, US claims and investigated in, in the same way? Yeah, um, one of the, um, our biggest investigations was actually about a bombing of a mosque uh, called Al Jinnah, um, or a mosque, near, a mosque near the town of Al Jinnah in Syria, where um, this mosque had been bombed. And initially, um, the local reports were saying, oh, Russia's bombed another mosque, Syria's bombed another mosque. Um, but within an hour, there was an image published from someone on the scene showing uh, a tail fin from a missile. And we managed to identify it as belonging to a Hellfire missile. So very quickly, it appeared that the US had bombed this mosque. Now, this mosque at the time, it was just before evening prayers. It was full of civilians. There was massive reports of casualties, uh, women and children killed. Um, and the US responded very quickly, saying that they had bombed a, a, a meeting hall full of Al-Qaeda. The thing is, we were looking at this, and there was nothing there that suggested this was just a meeting hall. To us, this was a mosque. Um, and the US came back and responded again, saying there is a mosque there, but it's this little building off to the side of the, you know, this satellite image they had. But what we, they didn't seem to know, and what, what we discovered within a few hours of research, is the building they had bombed was a new mosque built next to the old mosque that they had highlighted. Um, and we investigated this. We worked with Human Rights Watch and Forensic Architectures and basically were able to prove that despite the claims of America that this wasn't a mosque, that it was definitely a functioning mosque. We managed to find footage of the mosque being built, footage, footage of it inside the mosque. Um, I, I strongly suggest if you want to see kind of the cutting edge of how we do this work to look at Al Jinnah Mosque and uh, Forensic Architecture or Bellingcat. Um, but we were able to prove that this was a mosque that was bombed. And uh, after we published our work with Human Rights Watch and Forensic Architecture, America actually admitted it was a mosque that they had bombed. Um, the only thing is then they gave a press conference. Uh, they didn't publish a transcript. The only reason we know what was said is because an uh, organization called Air Wars wrote down what was um, said. And this is where they gave their final report on what happened. They said it was a mosque. They said they had bombed it because there was a, a shift change and not, someone didn't tell someone something, so it ended up being bombed. But their investigation still established that nearly everyone killed in there was definitely Al-Qaeda and that, was that there was only one civilian killed. Now, in their investigation, they only spoke to members of the US military. They didn't look at the open source information. They didn't look at interview people on the ground like they, we did. They didn't go to the hospitals and have you know, questions to the doctors to find out who was killed. So I, I think the way in which um, America deceives about its activities is very different from how Russia does it. Russia just lies constantly, very blatantly, um, and often in ways that can be very easily fact-checked. America tends to do this thing where they say, oh, we've had our investigation, and our investigation found this. And in the past, when it's been Afghanistan, for example, it's been very hard to investigate that because of the lack of open source information. Syria is completely different because people have been bombed there for six years. And there's lots of people who go out there and document stuff. There's the White Helmets documenting inform information, which we used in this case. Um, there's whole networks that have been established to gather information from this. So when something like that happens in Syria outside of um, ISIS-controlled areas, you can find a lot of information about this.
So I think it's really impressive how you work, uh, how you use crowdsourcing to work so quickly. But I still think about how it's so much easier to lie than it is to fact check, and how lies often spread faster than the truth, which comes afterwards. So I'm curious how you keep going, how you feel like you can combat these lies, which come so fast with your more, much more thorough work. Um, so, so that is true. I mean, it's very easy to tell a lie. I mean, I'm just looking at the reaction to the um, Duma chemical attack, the amount of untrue information that's being pushed out there, uh, you know, claiming that there's evidence of, you know, the white helmets faking the footage and all this information. And when you fact check it, which can take a while, it turns out to be untrue. What I found very useful is having a conversation, uh, especially through social media with people, about fake information and identifying it, showing people I to identifying it, and engaging them with that. Um, so with the example, for example, uh, with the um, Russian um, drone image, suppose from a computer game, that's a way where you can kind of inoculate people against that kind of thing. What I also find is when, uh, for example, in the case of MH17, Russia gave this press conference on July 21st, 2014, Days after MH17 had been shot down, 298 people were killed. Every single thing they said in that press conference was a lie. And it's a provable lie using this kind of investigation techniques. And the thing is, once you've told a lie, you can't untell it. So what I see a lot of now is people have become far more cynical towards the claims of Russia. I mean, they were before, but now they've actually got examples and case studies where they can actually point to clear examples where Russia has presented satellite imagery, radar imagery, and just lied about the contents of it. Um, and that means when stuff is published, journalists who are reporting on this aren't just saying, side A says this, side B says this. In many cases, they're actually looking into this in a lot more deeper fashion. But it is still something that's very time consuming and difficult. But on top of this, we're also looking at how we use this as evidence in justice and accountability ca cases. Um, so fact checking this stuff, even though it can take a very long time, builds towards the, that kind of case building as well. Um, open sources. So uh, in one of, the, one of your examples you were talking about, you showed the private CCTV footage from the bombing. I mean, I say private. Is it, it, how did you access that, for example? Because it seems like it's a, it's a, it is a private source of information. So um, what happened is one of the media centers who was working in the area published some of the, the CCTV footage. And they have a Facebook page. So we sent them a message saying, do you have more of that footage? And they said, yes, we do. Here you go. Um, the, the key part there is bothering to go and ask someone for it. Because the amount of times I've reached out to people in Syria through just their social media pages, and we're the first people who've bothered to actually ask them about this, um, it, it, it happens all the time. Um, so if you're working on Syria, it is amazing how much additional information you can get about these attacks just by reaching out to the people who are sharing this information on the first place. A fraction of the information gathered from Syria, the videos and the photographs, actually make it online. Um, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of content. Literally millions of videos have been posted over the last six years. But um, there's a lot more out there that can actually be really valuable for investigations, both as a journalist and as someone who's investigating war crimes and other violations. Another thing that I find extraordinary is the, 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 the footage of the uh, barrel bomb being pushed out of the helicopter. Who takes that kind of image and where do, you, where do they post it? Um, well, my understanding is what happened is the uh, person who filmed that, he was killed in fighting. The uh, people who killed him looked at his phone, found the footage, and then posted it online. And uh, another method as well, often you'll see uh, videos of uh, prisoners being abused. Um, and there was actually, uh, for a while, uh, it may still be ongoing, a kind of a bit of an industry for that. People were paying to get that footage to share so they could say, you know, isn't the Syrian government terrible for doing this kind of stuff? Um, and it's believed that actually encouraged that to happen because people were doing this knowing they could then sell it on to other people who would then post it on social media. Mm -hmm. They didn't care that this stuff was being shared, but this was supposedly what was happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, again, congratulations. It really is fabulous work uh, and very thoroughly done. Are you funded? If so, by whom? Uh, yeah, we currently um, receive funding from uh, Adesium in Holland, the Open Societies Foundation, uh, the Google Digital News Initiative, the National Endowment for Democracy, um, and we've approached a few more uh, funders as well. Um, so we, we're trying to get funding from as many different kind of um, funding organizations as possible. Um, and, and usually, I mean, we, 
I mean, I could talk for hours about trying to raise funding, but I'll, I'll, I'll spare you it. But one of the big frustrations is whenever you go to a funder, they expect you already to have funding. And very early on for Bellingham, that was very difficult because we didn't have any funding. So initially, we were funded purely through crowdfunding, um, which is a headache in itself. And it's pretty scary when you're asked for money and you see it creeping up very slowly. Um, so we, initially, we were crowdfunding a lot of our funding. Um, and we also run workshops as well that we uh, get funding from as well. Hello, uh, thank you very much. It's fantastic what you are doing. I have just a quick question. Behind all the technology that you are currently using, there is a human being behind it, making the investigation and getting the thing. We are now in, in, a, in a moment where we can generate automatically with intelligence, artificial intelligence, um, let's say fake content, fake video, fake porn. Do you believe that at some point you, Belling Cards, you're going to be able to create trusting machine detectors, machine that will be able to go the other way around and just like, let's say, investigate instead of the human being investigating? Um, I, I think there's two aspects to uh, the concerns about me machine learning. And um, for example, these kind of deep fake images, you know, you see these images of uh, Barack Obama saying stuff he's never said that have now been generated from videos. The one thing to consider there, a photograph or video, a piece of information does not exist by itself. It's a network of information. And what we try and do is explore that network of information. So you have a video of, you know, um, Barack Obama saying something terrible. You try and find the original footage. Where is that from? What you know, talk was that, what speech was that. You find that original information and check it. That's a very simple thing that can be done, but it's about exploring these networks of information and looking at all the different angles. The other side is on um, how can we use, you know, deep learning artificial intelligence for this work? Well, um, one way we've been trying to do it already is using it to look at videos from Syria. We've got a massive amount of these. Um, and we've been working with the Syrian Archive, which is an organization archiving this footage, um, to teach machines to identify things like uh, cluster bombs and different kinds of munitions. So we can automatically filter videos and make it easier for us to find interesting content. Now, that's never going to be perfect, or maybe in 10 years it might be perfect, but not for now. Um, the other thing we've been talking about as well is um, when we were doing our MH17 investigation, we looked at the 53rd Air Defense Brigade, and that was a basically a year's work looking for social media pages, recreating the structure of the 53rd Air Defense Brigade. Um, we've recently been talking to a few different universities in America who had want to train an artificial intelligence to basically do the same task. First, simply identify the networks, and then identify who is a soldier, then identify which unit they're in, and so on and so forth. So it might be what took us a year might take an hour in the future. But that has massive implications outside of journalism. If you can point a computer software to a social media network and say, find all the soldiers and tell me which army they belong to and which unit, and so on and so forth. We have time for one more question. If any of you want to add something. No. Thank you so much. That thank was you. fascinating. And thank you for on behalf of all of us. <laughs>